Uh, you know, first off, on behalf of uh, my name is Ken Hickman. I'm the museum director. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. I know it's uh, slightly less than pleasant out, there, but we certainly thank you for braving the rain. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the museum, we certainly certainly uh, welcome you to take a walk through the galleries once our program is complete today. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the museum, uh, we certainly would invite you to take take another walk through, or if you're interested in further supporting our mission, uh, you know, please consider becoming a member of our friends group. Uh, we have membership material out at the front desk. Uh, I've written up a, a lovely introduction here for our speaker today, but I have been, been threatened about actually presenting that. Uh, but, uh, so why don't I go ahead and if we could all give a warm welcome for former Olympian, World Cup soccer player, Penn State coach, and soccer icon, Walter Bart. In my neighborhood, you could always tell the soccer players, whenever they walk down the street and you said hello to them, they all says, how you doing? <laughs> how are you? How you doing? He's a soccer player. And that came from hitting wet soccer balls. <laughs> These things weighed a ton when it was raining or muddy and so forth. And uh, we had Werner Meath who could hit the ball from here to the other end of the stadium. And he really gave it a big shake. <laughs> this is a replica of the ball that was used in 1950. They had them uh, made up a half a dozen or so for the movie that they made, which uh, I don't even think it made television screens. <laughs> it was not very good. We, can I trust you? Can I trust you to hold it? You let them hold it for a little while, too. Uh, I was asked to say a few words. I said, nothing's new. So everything I'm going to say to you is ancient history. I've had a lot of phone calls and so forth about this game coming. Why don't you use the same write-up that you used four years ago? Jerry Longman from the New York Times, this is the fourth World Cup he's called me with. And I say to him, Jerry, you have three other write-ups, use that rather than work on a new one. Uh, this is ancient history. I have nothing new to add. Most of you know your history. I brought a couple of things. That was a headline in Brazil. Old timer. I got a couple of others that are from back in the 50s with a little bit of, if you read Portuguese, you'll be able to understand that. Uh, there's a nice picture of Alf Ramsey on the front of this one. If you know Alf Ramsey, uh, that's another one. This is one from down there. I had a lot of stuff that was loaned out and never returned. I don't know if that's uh, Spanish or Portuguese. It's green. It's old. <laughs> About the other. Uh, this is an old uh, picture from uh, the game uh, in '50 in uh, Belo Horizonte. This I put in there just for a variety. That's Marilyn Monroe kicking out the first ball in Yankee Stadium. We had a game there, and she did that at sort of. You can well, anybody will show you. No, just don't steal them. And this is another one, uh, uh, same picture from Germany. And she kicked the ball out from center field. And the photographers, who must have been 25, they're all laying prone with their cameras <laughs> looking up. And they had her kick out the ball at least 25 times. <laughs> they had one excuse, they had one excuse after another. And uh, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. So I was asked to first just come and answer some questions and have some fun. And then I found out I was supposed to make a speech. Do I need this? Yeah. Yeah. I was told I was supposed to make a speech, and soccer players don't make speeches. And uh, I'm going to turn this into a
question and answer period for the most part. I'll ask the questions, you give me the answers. So, uh, uh, we're gonna have a contest, the kids against the adults. Anybody under 40, raise your hand. Uh, wait a minute, a couple of you <laughs> your hands up. Okay, and everybody else is over 40, and the contest is under and over. Davies, my first wife, <laughs> will uh, uh, keep score. <laughs> the winner, I, I just found this out. I don't know if you know Norm Sir. Norm, would you stand up just a minute, please? Norm Sir married a young girl from South Africa. You can or cannot stand up. It's up to you. Okay. And uh, he said the winner of this contest He'll personally finance them to a trip to South Africa for the World Cup. <laughs> Starting, didn't you know that? <laughs> you waved over me. Uh, about that, so you have to do that. Okay. Oh, my notes are mixed up here. Ancient history. You want to remember the past, but you don't want to live in it. But let's see what you know. First question. You give me the answer, first one with the hand up, or you get a point for answer each correct. <clears throat> the winner of the first World Cup. Yes, sir. Uruguay. Okay, year. Oh, somebody helped you. 1930? Yes. Okay, they got two right. Second World Cup. The over in the 40s. I think they're over 40. Are you over 40? <laughs> you asking a question? I can't even answer. Second World Cup? Second World Cup. Italy. Okay, where was it played? France. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never let an Irishman answer. <laughs> where? It was either France or Italy. Rome. <laughs> Third World Cup. Italy. Who won it? Oh, Italy again. Over 40? Hey, are you over 40? No, I put I'm I'm the underspoke. Come on down and sit with the kids. I'm not going to answer anymore. I mean, yeah, under 40. Under 40. Third World Cup, where was it played? I was going to say Uruguay won. Uruguay won the first one. Third one did. Who won the second? Who won the third one? Or did Uruguay win the You talk one? before I call on you. Disqualified. <laughs> 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 Italy. Played in Rome. The uh, fourth World Cup, 19 when? 19 when? What year? 1942. It was the war. <laughs> 50. I can't ask that again. Where was it played? And Brazil? Was your hand up? Yeah. Over 40. <laughs> okay. Uh, there were 18 World Cups played between 1930 and uh, 19 or 2006. Who won the most? Yes, sir. Okay, give him a point. Over 40. Uh, who has second? Second most World Cups out of the 18. Italy. Italy. How many? Three. Four. Third. How many? Deutschland, three. Three, okay, they're all over 40s. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. What organization conducts the World Cup? Who called out? You can't call out. <laughs> 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 Not all the time. <laughs> this is run by FIFA. This, this, FIFA sent me the speech. <laughs> right. uh, roughly, how many countries belong to FIFA? Any idea? Well, you lose a point if you give the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> Irish. Got it. He, he's got an answer in front of him. Fifty. How many? Fifty. 
<laughs> Over 200, 208 to the last count, 208. How many get to the final, uh, which was played in? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> How many get to the final tournament in South Africa? Oh. 64, you're half right. 32. 32. 32. <laughs> over 40, I think. Are you over 40? <laughs> All right. Okay. They had the preliminary tournaments to get down to 30, um, to teams, but the world is divided up into six sections. Six sections. Does anybody know all six? It's a tough question. You know all six or do you think you do? It's a five point loss if you <laughs> Are you over forty? I don't think so. Okay, well, it's only one that under forty. Go ahead. That's easy. Give me the countries, the roughly the countries. They, oh, now you're people, changing your question. <laughs> there are five divisions. Most people know them by. You the, <laughs> North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Give him two points. <laughs> <laughs> Under 40, he gets two points. He gets three points. CONCACAF stands for what? North America? South no. CONCACAF, C O N. Confe Confederation of North America, Central America, football. Close, close. Yeah. Minus one. <laughs> uh, Confederation of North America, Central America, and and Caribbean nations. Roughly 36 countries compete for two or three spots in the final 32. And each of the six sections <clears throat> have a predetermined number of teams after they have their preliminary games. <clears throat> that go to the final, the final 32. This is the 19th run coming up. Uh, who are the four favorites to reach the semifinals? The odd makers have given out that uh, statistic. Anybody want to guess on the four teams? Yes, sir. Brazil, Argentina, uh, Spain, and England. England. Tell me, are you Spain, England, and Spain are right? Brazil, Argentina. Brazil and Serbia. That's a, an odd choice, but they're the four that are expected by the odds makers. The odds makers don't always know. <laughs> In 1950, we were 500 to one odds. Uh, this year, the United States is 65 to one odds. They were wrong in 1950, they may be wrong again in uh, 19, uh, 2010. Don't correct me, <laughs> This year's team, 19, uh, 2010 team, is a much better team than our team was. They're better prepared, they're better organized, they're better coached, uh, uh, they're ready to play and if I was coaching one of the other 31 teams the United States is one of the teams that I wouldn't want to play against I don't know if they're going to have enough possession and enough this or that to win the game but I know they're going to be a difficult team to beat they've proven that in recent games they play hard they, they uh, don't make uh, silly mistakes, or they haven't made any silly mistakes. And any of the 31 teams could not look at the United States and say, this is going to be an easy game. The United States will give anybody in that tournament a battle, and they're capable of winning any of their games. They may lose all three. They may win all three to get to the next round. But I, I really think that uh, uh, they're going to make a good show down there and um, I'm certainly looking forward to watching the game on, on Saturday. And this again is another situation of David versus Goliath. 
the underdog playing against a favorite, or my favorite analogy is sometimes the dragon wins. And that was a cartoon that was out years ago, and it shows a knight in shining armor on the ground. His mask is twisted, his lance is broken in half, the horse is down on its knees, and he's in disarray, and the dragon is standing over him with flames coming out of its mouth. And it was a case where the dragon wins. Win. Usually it's the English knight that wins everything, but this time the dragon won. And I hope that happens, uh, I hope that happens this time. Now let me refer, that took me the whole of 15 minutes to put this speech together, so bear with me. Uh, because I'm done. <laughs> Boy, I have to know I have some odds and ends here. 1950, we'll talk a little bit about 19, uh, 1950. Uh, the history of FIFA and the history of England go hand in hand. <coughs> England is giving credit for developing the game, promoting the game, organizing the rules. They were looked at as the kings of soccer all the way up to that time in 1950. They never lost a home game up until 1950. Um, the look at England playing soccer, the look at United States playing soccer, they were from two worlds. England at that time had full-time professionals. They were making money, but not what they're making today. Who would guess what they made in 1950 as a league? Players didn't get an individual salary. It was run by the administrators Every player in the league got the same salary. Would anybody guess what it was in 1950? Three pounds. Five, uh, I'm sorry, 12 pounds. In 1950 it was 12 pounds. At that time the exchange rate would have been $36 a week and three dollars or three pounds for a win. Um, and that was considered double what the average working man made in England. But the boards of directors and chairmen and all those people pretty much ran everything and the players were second-rate citizens as far as mixing with the administrators in the league. And they were treated as such. One quick story, Wilf Mannion, who was a great player for England before the war and after the war, um, they had, used to have a game, uh, England against the world, and it was played in Hampton Park in Scotland very often. He scored one or two goals, he set up another, England wins five to two or something, and he takes his first class ticket and trades it in on a tourist ticket to come back by train from Glasgow to Mothersboro where he played. He's sitting in his suitcase, he said, in the aisle, and talking to a person, and it turned out this person was a reporter. The next day in the paper, it was published, England's hero travels a tourist class. He's pulled into the office, the FA office, uh, reprimanded. He never played for England again, and he was a top player. I was with him in Brazil in 1988 or so, and he wound up as a tea boy when he was done playing. He was a tea boy in a factory. That was his job for the rest of his time. And that means when it was tea time in the morning, he served the tea around to all the workers. But here's a, here's a guy that was considered one of England's best, and he fumbled one time, and he's paid for it the rest of his life. England, at the time, had a very good reputation of sportsmanship, of 
playing within the rules, of setting the standard, of not making excuses, no diving, no fake falls in the penalty area. And they set the standard for soccer for years. And it was just years later that, that, uh, that the salaries went up when they formed their union. I played professional soccer for about 25 years. I started for $5 a game. I was 15 years old, started for $5 a game. The most I made in, in 1950, I was playing for a team in Philly, I was being paid $25 a game. And you laugh at that today, people would laugh at that. But I was only making $50 a week teaching school, so $25 on a game for Sunday, plus $3 for a win. <laughs> it was good money. The most I ever made was $50 a game. When we went to Brazil for two weeks, we got $100 a week, and we lived as professionals. We had our meals served to us. We had a training ground, which we didn't do any training on. <laughs> but uh, the English, they were full-time professionals. That was their job. And uh, again, nobody was, was uh, they didn't prepare you for after soccer. You didn't have a trade. Uh, you didn't have a profession. So you come out at 30 years of age, 35 years of age, after playing professional soccer, and you're taking the most, why are you looking mad at me? You look like you're mad at me. <laughs> My wife is sitting there with an expression, and I think she's mad at me. Do I worry about you, Walter? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and the league itself was considered the top professional league in the world, but they didn't live high off the hog like players do today. To take a look at our team, we were selected from tryout games all around the country. Now they had those games for the Olympics in 48, and then in 49 the United States had to qualify in the preliminary rounds. We played games in Mexico, and a lot of the players that played on the Olympic team still played on the national selection. Then after the tournament in Mexico in 49, they still had tryouts, and the final 16 players, eight were from the West and eight from the East. The West started with Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburgh, Chicago, St. Louis, Detroit, LA, and so forth, where they had pockets of soccer. Soccer was an East Coast game, basically Boston, to Washington. So the selection, as a, they say it was honest, but I think it was a little bit of politics played so that no one could complain. Eight players were selected from the West, eight from the East. The only other factor there was the president of United States soccer at that time <coughs> was from St. Louis. Five St. Louis players made that team. <laughs> that really was a coincidence. <laughs> but, but they were good players and uh, so forth. The coach was Bill Jeffrey, a Scotsman from Dundee, who came over here to work at the Altoona Railroad. And uh, like all factory areas, uh, industry, overseas, they had teams. So he had a team at the Altoona Railroad and he brought them over to play Penn State for a couple of years. And then Penn State was smart enough to hire him, and they gave him a job in the industrial part of the school, some type of uh, machinist work or whatever his trade was. So he coached here for a number of years, and he was the coach of the 1950 team. He was a good coach, but in this case, there was no time to coach. When we played on a national team or played on a select game, you got a letter or a phone call, we're playing so-and-so at this stadium, be there at one o'clock, we'll supply the uniform, you supply everything else. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it was for the World Cup. We had one official practice game. Never a practice, but we had a practice game 
against an English touring team in 1950. Played at Randall's Island. They beat us one to nothing on a free kick late in the game. After the game that night, we left to go to Brazil. It took us two and a half days to get there. We had engine trouble. We landed at San Juan and we laid over for 18 hours. I think they fixed the plane because we got to Brazil. <laughs> it may have been a new plane. You still look mad. <laughs> <laughs> and we only had we had 16 players that night. Everybody had a full-time job. No one made a living playing out of playing soccer at that time. I was a school teacher. Our goalkeeper was an undertaker. Uh, Harry Keo was a mailman. There were a number of different jobs, but everyone had a full-time <coughs> job. And here's an example as. Uh, what professional soccer was all about back at that time. Two and a half years later, in 1953, we have an exhibition game uh, with England at Yankee Stadium. We get this usual letter, uh, we'll give you the uniform, you bring everything else. <laughs> so it's a schedule for a Sunday. Davies and another player and his wife drive up to New York. We get there for the Sunday. It's pouring rain. And the Yankees had the right as to how the field was to be used, and they didn't want the game played on a Sunday there because they had games later in the week, and they didn't think the field would be uh, OK. So it's rescheduled for Monday night. Now, I just drove. 150 miles up to New York, turn around and come back. Monday, I taught school. I got out at 3 o'clock. Same group, in the car, drive up to New York. I think I got there about 15 minutes before the game. We played the game. After the game, we drove home. Now, I got good money for that game. I got $25. <laughs> and I got expense money. Ten dollars to drive from Philly to New York and back. Now you get a tank of gas for five dollars, and you could get two meals. I treated my wife to dinner. We got two meals for the other five dollars. So uh, that was soccer back in the back in the fifties. Uh, are there any questions up to this point? Can everybody understand me? Am I talking too fast? Or? Hey, Walt. So, yes, ma'am. What did you have for medical assistance and trainers? A sponge. All of them. A sponge. <laughs> sponge. A sponge. We had a trainer, not with that team, but another team. The, the rule was, whatever you hurt, tell the trainer the opposite. If you hurt your right leg, tell him to look at your left. One of our players put down on the shoulder and he had, a, obviously, a broken collarbone. His shoulders hanging right down. And this guy, we used to call him uh, Bull Cooper. It, there was a second name, Bull hyphen. There was another name there. <laughs> Four letter word, I can't quite remember. We, we, uh, it was, and Bill, uh, Bill was not only the team doctor, he took care of the dirty uniforms, and his wife washed them, and he was, he was what was called a stuff man. Not stuff, stuff, in the German way of pronouncing it. Well, this guy had the bum shoulder. Bill came out on the field. He's down on the ground. He's moaning. And he stands or sits him up. He stands him up. And he takes his arm and he winds up. And the guy's, oh, he says, you're OK. Go ahead. He, says, he said, I could move him. I had food. Nothing's broken. But the other thing is that my uh, young friend over there said, the trainer, most of them just had a gallon jug of water and a sponge. And the sponge was called the magic sponge. No matter what got hurt, they would wet the sponge and squeeze it out over the injury. <laughs> they give it a little rub and say, OK, get back in. So, a lot of you guys remember that. Some of you don't. Did you answer any questions yet? <laughs> Did you? Yeah. OK. Uh, what shape is a soccer ball? 
around? <laughs> what did you do with all the money? <laughs> <laughs> I was married at the time, so I didn't see any of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> so going down to Brazil, we had no preparation other than that one game. We got there, and I think two or three days later, we played Spain. Now, all that travel, our game Sunday, all that travel, get down there. Bill Jeffrey, as I say, was a good coach. He knew at that time there's no way he can do anything other than get players in the best position for the team and the best position for the players. And that was one of the few select teams that I played with over the years that hit it off well. Usually when we had to play another foreign team or a foreign team, it was a select team, but when we played with our own team, we usually did better, which is natural. But this team hit it off. We had a couple of sets of twos that helped out. On the left side were the two Sousa brothers, no relation. Sousa is like Smith in uh, Portuguese. They were very good players. They played as a, a twosome on the left side. On the right side was Frank Wallace and Gino Pariani, who played together as kids in St. Louis and played on the same adult team. The two midfielders were Ed McElvenny and myself, and we played together on the same team in Philadelphia. Wingers are usually loners, the center forward is usually a gypsy, <laughs> the center back is usually a tough guy, and the two wing backs are usually players that at one time were forwards or midfielders, and they moved them back a little bit. And we had two guys that were good with the ball and good defenders, uh, Joe Maga and uh, Harry Keogh. So we really didn't have any preparation of training as a team before we played. And Bill Jeffrey, I give him a lot of credit. He didn't try to invent players and put them in different positions. He used what he had in the position that they were used to uh, playing in. And at that time, again, no substitutions. Uh, everybody wore, if you didn't have your own number at that time, the numbers were 2 to 11. 2 in the back, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Anybody that played outside left was always number 11. I was a left half, I was number 6. The uh, uh, lineups would always be put, they'd put the numbers on a blackboard and write the name in and you knew what position you were playing. And all that changed later <coughs> on. But the substitutions, if you, if you had a player that was injured, you played with 10. Seconds injured, you played with nine. In the Olympics, uh, uh, we wound up playing with eight players in uh, 1948. And uh, things were different. Things were different. Uh, I thought, I thought we had a pretty good team, and I thought after we played the game in New York, that didn't do bad. We played against Spain, we led one nothing with eight minutes to play. We didn't do bad, and we thought we could go on the field and maybe keep it respectable, three, four, five goals. <coughs> As I say, England was king of football. It was expected that England and Brazil would meet in the final. What didn't happen, because when we won, when we beat England, and the Brazilians at that time, the, the crowd, again, you get anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000, depending on who made the write-up or made the estimate. <laughs> I'm guessing, I'm guessing there was a good 20,000 there, and the majority of them were Brazilians. There was an American uh, military base close by. Probably a hundred came from there. The English had a mining uh, operation somewhere close to Palo Horizonte, and they had about a hundred there. But as the game wore on, 
we heard more and more cheers when we did something right. And at the end of the game, every move we made brought a cheer. Not that they were rooting against England, but they were rooting, they were rooting for us. Because if we won that game, chances were England wouldn't get to the final. And that's the way it, uh, that's the way it turned out. Um, Walter Winterbottom, anybody remember that name of the old timers? He was in charge of English. They always had a person that was in charge of the whole English operation. Uh, Wilkinson is there now. Howard Wilkinson? Yeah, he's there now. I met him at the yep. convention. Uh, Walter Winterbottom <clears throat> came down to Curitiba where we played Spain and reported back to his group he said, let's not take it too easy with these guys. Let's make sure we win it early. He said, they have a few players that are pretty good players. Uh, so he did give his team a little bit of a, a uh, warning that uh, you know, we were a little bit better than most uh, people thought. The way the game went, the first, um, first half of the first half, uh, we couldn't get out of our own half of the field. They were all over us. They hit the woodwork a couple of times, but nothing went in. Our goalkeeper, Frank Borgie, was a minor league uh, baseball player. He was also the undertaker. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he, was, he was a good goalkeeper at any time. He, he, today, I'm sure Frank would have been considered a good goalkeeper. The English, as they do today, they played a lot of balls across the goal mouth for head balls. They, they say to be a center forward on an English team, you had to be six foot with a long neck <laughs> because they like those head balls in the goal mouth. Well, um, Frank cut off an awful lot of balls before they got to anybody. He didn't mishandle a ball the whole game. <clears throat> and where they were getting shots at fairly good angles in the first half, in the second half, they were getting poorer shots. And we got a lucky goal late in the first half. Uh, Ed McElvenny, my teammate from Philadelphia, had a throw-in. We're going at that goal. He has a th throw-in maybe 35 out yards out on the right-hand side. He threw the ball to me, I collected it, pushed it ahead, and took a legitimate shot from 25, 28 yards out. Bert Williams, the English goalkeeper, I'm sure my ball was on the frame. It was hit fairly good. He had to move a little bit to his right, and I'm sure he would have had the ball. There's no picture that I've ever seen that shows Joe Gachins heading the ball but he, Harry Keogh, who was playing on the opposite side, had a good view, and he swears to this day that Joe Gagins left his feet, he was full out between a couple of English players and got a piece of the ball. Now the reporters after the game said it was an accident. It hit Joe in the ear, it hit him in the back of the head, it didn't hit him, it hit somebody else. But he got a piece of it, and the deflection caught the goalkeeper leaning to his right and the ball going in to his left. So it wasn't a great goal. It wasn't an assist. It was a shot. I don't think we had assist back then. I don't think they used that term, an assist. But in any way, Joe put the ball in the net, and they're still arguing about it. Like they're arguing about the World Cup in 66 did Jeff Hurst's ball hit the underneath of the upright and go in? Or did that Russian linesman that called it a goal have bad eyes? <laughs> <laughs> They're still arguing about that. Two things happened in the second half that when things go wrong for a team, they go wrong. England couldn't buy a goal. On one occasion, Shane Mortensen, who was a, a 
uh, considered one of England's all-time greats, beat our center back. And he's probably 30 yards out, one home free on the goalkeeper. Charlie Colombo, who was our center back, and was known to play outside the rules on occasion, brought him down with a football tackle. <laughs> tackled him from behind, around the legs, and brought him down. Now this is, I'm not sure whether this is fact or fiction. How many Italians are here? <laughs> any, any Italians? Oh, I'll be careful. <laughs> Charlie Colombo was Italian. I think he spoke a little Italian. The referee was Italian. The referee, there were no yellow cards or red cards then either. He either threw him out or gave him a warning. He blew the whistle. He, he's helping Charlie up. <laughs> Not the, 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 the And he's saying to him, this comes from Harry Keogh and, Fra and uh, Frank Borgie. I don't know if that's a true story. The referee is picking him up and saying, Bono, Bono. <laughs> For you that don't speak, who doesn't speak Italian? Good, good. Whether that's true or not, it's a good story. But he didn't call the foul. Excuse me. He didn't call. He did call the foul. And Charlie should have been thrown out of the game. Without question, it was a type of foul that most officials would have thrown the player out of the game with no substitution. And, and uh, since they were both Italian, something happened and, <laughs> and Charlie got away with it. Harry Keogh says if that was his mother-in-law, he would have tackled her. <laughs> uh, again, whether well, that's true or not. But, uh, uh, well, whatever. Um, Finish that page. The second issue there, that second half late, they had a shot that Frank Borgie was playing off his line a couple of yards, but he didn't quite get all the ball, got a piece of it, came down, and he had to reach back a little bit. Now the English were saying that the ball was over the line, and the referee said no play on. But Harry or Frank reached back and cleared the ball off his line. So those two things stand out in my mind as game changers. The, the game could have gone the other way. If they got one, I'm sure they would have gotten five. But uh, when the final whistle blew, which we were certainly relieved to hear, uh, <laughs> Joe Gagins, our center forward from Haiti, it's an interesting story in itself. Joe Gagins was carried off the field along with Frank Borgie, and I'm sure they were the two ones that stood out. Frank with his goalkeeping, and uh, <coughs> Joe with his, uh, his goal. Um, they carried the, him off the field, they carried uh, Frank off the field. I forget what I was leading up to. But in any event, people say, you know, the big celebration. There was no celebration at that time. At most, you shook hands with players that you came in contact with, some of your own players, but as soon as the game was over, you walked off. There were no backflips, there was no screaming, no forward rolls, no celebrations, and I really can't remember any. The papers printed that we, the night before the game, that most of the team had been drinking. That's not true. Most of the team didn't drink. And that's rare for a soccer team. <laughs> most of them wouldn't even take a beer or a glass of wine. Uh, following the game, they said we had another wild celebration. I don't remember. Maybe I wasn't invited to the party. <laughs> I don't know. But we didn't have any party. There was no big celebration. When we came back, we came back on three different flights. At the airport, my wife was the only person that met me. And I didn't even go home. I went up to the mountains, the Adirondacks, where I had a summer job. But there was no uh, celebration at the game. There was no celebration after the game. 
There was no celebration when we came home. This year, in 2010, there's been more write-ups, more television coverage, more radio, more everything than the other 59 years put together. And a couple of things that are making this tournament probably bigger than it, than it normally would be, one way it was that this is the first time in 60 years England has played an official competition against the United States. So they've had to swallow that lump for 60 years waiting to get a chance to tie up the series. Now even if they win, they may have to wait another 60 years for the third game. That's one thing. The other thing is on a sad note, Joe Gaitens, or so we had three foreign-born players. Everybody else was born in the States. Joe Gaitens was from Haiti. He came up to play, played with him for two years in New York. He was a good player, good goal scorer. Joe Gaitens came up here to go to school at Columbia and get a degree in business. His family was all professional people. I always thought Joe was a mixture of Belgian and native. He was a mixture of German and native. The Kaiser, whoever was in charge of Germany back in the middle 80s, sent his grandfather or his great-grandfather over to Haiti on a business trip. And he wound up staying there, became ambassador or something and so forth. Joe was the least political person you'd ever want to meet. His family was professional people. Joe was a soccer guy. He could care less uh, about anything other than soccer. After the 50 World Cup, he went back and played for the Racing Club of Paris, which was their top team at the time. And after a couple of years, uh, he had some injuries and he came back to Haiti. Uh, he was back there, but we visited, we played in Haiti in 53 in 57 for preliminary games and in 57 his family got together all the agents family it must have been 50 75 of them when we had a little get together at his house and that's the last i saw of joe in 63 the, 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 the fairly certain he was picked up by papa doc his regime he was shot either that day or the next day at the prison. <clears throat> the Pollyannic law says his wife cannot collect any of his estate for seven years. So seven years she had to wait before it was determined that poor Joe was shot. Now, there was ever a guy that was non-political was Joe. He could care less about anything. And uh, uh, they've had some benefits for him. But this tragedy in Haiti, along with the Joe Gaitzen story, is getting a lot of coverage. Our association, the United States Soccer Federation, sent $3 million to Haiti to help with uh, the youth of soccer. And there are a number of things going on right now where maybe they'll do a little bit more to honor Joe Gaitzen's. Ed McIlvenny was our second foreign player he had come over two or three years before 1950. He played with us in um, Philadelphia. He went back to England. He signed with uh, Manchester United, played with them for two years, then he wound up coaching. The third player, foreign born, was our left back, Joe Macca, who played in Belgium. And he played in New York in the, league, in the East Coast League. A uh, very good player from um, Belgium. Everyone has passed away except. They just don't interrupt me. <laughs> Everyone has passed away except four of us. Our goalkeeper, Frank Borgie, our right back, Harry Keogh, um, myself, I think. <laughs> and, uh, who was it, Oh, uh, Clarky Souza. Uh, Clarky Souza turns 90 this month or next month. 
One little story about Frank Borgie. Most of the guys on the team had been in the service. Frank Borgie was a medic, and on uh, D-Day, first person he patched up on the beaches was a German. The second person he patched up, he didn't know who it was, and about 15, 20 years after the war, it, they used to watch this guy at banquets and so forth, and they eyeballed each other, and they say, I know you from somewhere. Here was Jack Buck, the baseball announcer. <laughs> and they hadn't seen each other since the war. They finally said, where, where, where could I know you from? Baseball, from uh, this, from that. And they finally came to the conclusion, Frank patched them up on the beaches. Wow. So we had a half a dozen guys. The movie was terrible. <laughs> it was Hollywood. Well, it was Davies. It wasn't good. <laughs> they, 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 uh, uh, there was very little truth in it other than the score at the end. <laughs> so, uh, nobody was depicted as they were. Frank Borgie did nothing but smile. He was played by that Gerard Butler, if any of you saw the show, and he's a famous actor now. And he had a big part in the movie. Everybody was jealous of uh, Frank that he had this big part. But nobody was depicted in the movie like they were in actual life and, and so forth. Now, I'm just about out of gas. <laughs> and uh, uh, almost, almost an hour. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? You have one? Come on. Ask one. Go ahead. Don't ever tell anybody if a coach says to you what position do you play, tell them wherever the ball is. <laughs> right? Don't let them stick you at your age, don't let them stick you in any position. Wherever the ball is, that's where you want to be. <laughs> and don't pass it to anybody. <laughs> this is true now. Don't pass it to anybody unless you know they'll pass it back to you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. What's your question? At least ask me. Ask me what time it is. What time is it? Two minutes to two. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just, you didn't mention how gracious the English oh. team was. But are there any Good people sport. sympathizing with the English team? No. <laughs> Does anybody want to hear anything? <laughs> As I said, I did mention that the English set the standard for soccer in a lot of ways, and one was sportsmanship. When that game ended, can you imagine them having to go back to England and explain a loss? Mm. They're still trying to explain it. <laughs> it was easy to explain the, the victory. We were lucky. That's all. The English players, I didn't hear one English player after that game make any excuse or alibi. I walked off the field with Tom Finney, who was one of their all-time great wing players. And he said, I played against him at two other times, too. And he said to me, he said, nice game. And he said, good luck in the next one. And he said, uh, you know, we could have played until next Wednesday and not scored a goal. It was one of those games. And I think that's the best thing about sports. At any time, you get a rinky-dink team that can go out and be the top professional team. And uh, I, I think that's great about sports, that that thing can happen. Yes, sir? I watched a movie, so they Could you speak in German, please? I think would help. But uh, I watched a movie, and... Uh, so they were portrayed as a little cocky, and there was this thing when you were at the beginning of the match, and you were saying, "Yeah, let's see it as a competition." You said this, and you said that this would be war. You wouldn't would be dead right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't no, absolutely, out. absolutely not. I I never remember one bit of ba <laughs> banner back and forth with another player uh, administrator. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. That's Hollywood. 
Disney World, uh, Fairyland, whatever you want to call it, but that did not happen. The game they showed in the rain, that did not happen. That was played in New York. And it was the 1 0 game. There were so many uh, uh, misconceptions in that game. Here's one thing England played in blue. England, oh, I'm sorry. Can I finish just a minute? England played in the blue uh, blue shirt. <coughs> they never play have played in blue since. <laughs> Except, I just heard last week or so they did play one other game in blue, not the dark blue, a sky blue, and they lost four one to somebody. <laughs> and that's the first I ever heard of that. But they've never played in blue for a big match since that time. <laughs> yes, sir. When did you start? Wait, wait just a minute, please. <laughs> What's your name? Keaton. Eaton? Keaton. Like you're eating all the time? <laughs> <laughs> With a K. With a K. Keaton. Uh, Keaton. Oh, Keaton. Keaton. Oh. When did you start playing soccer? Eleven years old. Lighthouse Boys Club. Philadelphia. You know who my first coach was? Bart McGee. You know who Bart McGee is? No. Bart McGee scored the first goal for the United States against Belgium in 1930. In 1930, the U.S. team beat Belgium 3-0. They beat Paraguay 3-0. And in the semifinals, they lost to Argentina. And they had a third place finish in the first World Cup played in 1930. And Bart McGee was from my club, a lighthouse club. And he was my first coach with my first team. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Did your sons have any choice as to what sport they would play? They played everything. <laughs> yeah, and Kate and my Chris says this all the time. He said he used to take a little pleasure in this finding out what sports the better players played in football. Uh, you know, the quarterbacks, the ends, uh, I guess they called them the skilled people and so forth. And he said, almost without exception, every football player that he talked to in the NFL played multiple sports. And that's one of my prime complaints today. Number one is overcoaching. And number two is kids until they reach a certain age, they should be playing as many sports as possible. And these coaches that say, you have to, if you want to play on my team, you have to play in the summer league, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. And uh, I blame the coaches, and it, it bothers me no end. And the thing is, a lot of them are hypocrites, because the first guy that's a good basketball player, and he's six foot eight, and the coach wants him to play in the summer league in basketball, he says, oh, he said, Summer's for baseball. I'm going to play baseball in the summer. And the coach will say, well, in your case, I'll make an exception. <laughs> but kids should play as many sports as possible and, and have fun. Uh, too many coaches take the fun out of kids. What kid wants to stand in line and wait for a chance to kick the ball? I'm truthful now with you. You're young enough. Don't pass the ball. <laughs> Unless they start to kick you too much. If they kick you too much, then you know you have to get rid of it early. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. You're